Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to continue our discussion on frequency domain analysis and introduce one of the most important concepts in controls and dynamic systems engineering, namely the Bode plot. Now, over the course of uh, the next several videos, we're going to see that the Bode plot is actually key to understanding the frequency domain response of a system. For today's discussion, though, I'd like to keep it a little bit short and sweet here, and we'll just start to look at the introduction of a Bode plot, namely what it is, as well as how it's generated. As well as uh, some numerical, aka MATLAB tools to help with the workflow and analysis of Bode plots. So what we're going to do here is we're also going to build off some of the concepts we discussed in our previous video where we introduced the concept of frequency domain analysis. So if you haven't had a chance to watch this previous video, please take a moment to check it out before continuing on. Now, in the previous video, we discussed how frequency domain analysis involved basically analyzing how a linear time invariant system responded to sinusoidal inputs. So, to draw the picture here, what we discovered last time was if you had some dynamic system, and again, this was our linear time invariant system, and we saw it was convenient to characterize this thing using a transfer function, maybe g of s. And as we discussed in the past, if you have inputs of the form u of t and it has outputs y of t, what we were interested in doing with frequency domain analysis was using a very specific type of input, namely I want to use a sinusoid of a sine omega t here. Okay, so the input was just a series of pure sine waves of amplitude A and frequency omega. And what we saw here was that at the end of the day here, if we were only interested in the steady state response here, so maybe I'm going to add Y steady state here, right? If we ignore the transients here, we saw that eventually coming out the other side of this system, you were going to get something that looked like um, A times magnitude of G of J omega sine omega t plus theta here, okay? So here we saw that magnitude of g of j omega, right? This was um, basically an amplification factor which is effectively just the, um, the magnitude of this imaginary number g of j omega. So in other words, it is the real part of g of j omega squared plus the imaginary part of oops, of g of j omega squared to the one half, right? And then this theta here, right? This was just the angle of this imaginary number g of j omega, right? Which we said a convenient way to write that down was just to use your good old fashioned a tan 2 function and you're going to give it the imaginary part of the g complex number and the real part of the complex number g of j omega, right? And again, the one thing to maybe continually mention here is again, a tan 2 here, we're assuming that you pass it the y component and then the x component here, right? So if you're using a specific software implementation of, of the four quadrant inverse tangent, just make sure you check, are you supposed to give it the x or the y value first? This is, I believe, the MATLAB way of doing it. Mathematica actually flips it around and wants you to give you the x component then the y component. So again, just something to be um, aware of, but that's a slight detour and is not terribly relevant here to our discussion. I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page here that you put in a sine wave here, you get a sine wave coming out, but the sine wave is amplified by this factor, which is the magnitude of g of j omega, and it's phase shifted by this angle here, right? And the angle is nothing more than the angle of that imaginary number, right? Okay, so, um, there, we saw that basically the steady state response of the system then is fully characterized by just these two quantities, right? If you know what the magnitude or this amplification factor is, if you know the magnitude of the uh, imaginary number g of j omega, that tells you how much the, the, the uh, sine wave will be amplified or attenuated. And finally, the second item that you need to know about is the amount of phase shift that's, that's introduced. So if you know those two things, you basically have fully characterized the frequency, the steady state frequency response of this system here, right? So um, in our last video, I think what we did here is we examined 
how this amplification factor and this phase shift um, looked like for a single input frequency omega here. And I think last time we used omega of three radians per second, right? So the natural next question is probably, well, how do these two factors, right? We said that these two fully characterize the frequency response of the system. So how do those two parameters change as a function of omega here, right? And that's actually exactly what a Bode plot is. So a Bode plot is just a graphical way to basically plot out those two quantities. And maybe let's try to sketch them out right here. Um, is a Bode plot is really just plotting this first factor, right, which was magnitude of g of j omega versus uh, omega. So again, you've got amplification factor on the y-axis. You've got frequency on the x-axis. So this is basically telling you how does the amplification factor vary with omega here, right? And then the second thing we got to plot here is the theta here. So again, I'm just going to draw it like such. Omega on the x-axis and now just angle of g of j omega on the y-axis here. So all this second plot does is it basically tells us how does the phase shift uh, vary with omega right that's basically uh the two things here right so that is what a Bode plot is so let's just go ahead and label this thing as um this is kind of a Bode plot and maybe tell you what put a little star here because we're not really we're gonna we're gonna do a couple of modifications to make this a traditional Bode plot here um and, and maybe right now it, it might behoove us to discuss a little bit of history here. Um, so the Bode plot, this was named after a, uh, actually an American engineer here. He was born in uh, Wisconsin, actually, and he developed this in the 1930s. So it was uh, engineer Henrik uh, Wade, and here's where we may or may not get into trouble. I'm going to call it Bode, and I think most people call it Bode here. Um, again, he's an American engineer, but he had dust, Dutch ancestry, and I believe if you look up the Dutch pronunciation of this, it's it's like Boda or something like that. Heck, maybe in French it's Bode, maybe it's Bode. Yeah, depending on who you talk to, I'm sure you're going to hear this pronounced different ways. The, tr the, the most common pronunciation is just Bode plot, so I'm going to go with Bode here. And I think if you talk with other people in the controls engineering realm, you'll, you'll also get Bode here as the pronunciation. So anyway, um, let's just, this might help us from, from a historical perspective, because it's actually kind of interesting that this isn't super old technology, actually. It was, you know, developed within the last hundred years here. Okay. So um, what I think we might want to do here is maybe let's look at a very simple example here of this. So if you remember in our last lecture, I think we had an example of a mass spring damper system. Um, and it's actually a little bit difficult for me to, uh, to, 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 to demonstrate the actual system here because I think the last system we, had, we used was a horizontal system where you had a mass, you had a spring, you had a damper here, and you were applying some kind of force to this system. And I think we derived a transfer function for this, but let me get something which is roughly equivalent to this. Uh, it's just another type of mass spring damper system, and I think it might help us understand um, the behavior on what a Bode plot is going to capture for us. So tell you what, I made a little demonstration of this here um, using, I, I guess I quote unquote borrowed again, this is my daughter's uh, lunch sack here. I think she's got an apple or some juice in here. Anyway, I'm going to return it to her so she can have lunch tomorrow. But you can see what I've got here is I've got this mass sitting here on a spring here, okay? This is my, my, my kind of cheapo spring here. So what I want to do right now is I kind of want to investigate. Let me, let me erase some of this so we can kind of get a little bit more room to kind of show what I'd like to demonstrate here. Okay, so all I'm going to do here is I would like to have the input be the, uh, th this, this uh, whatever you want to call it, the mounting point here of this mass spring damper system up here. And what I want to do here is I'm going to move this up and down between, let, let, let's pick two, two regions. Maybe, maybe let's start up from here to, maybe let's not do too much. So I don't know, just two inches here of motion. All I'm going to do is I'm going to input a sine wave 
in here. Okay, so you can kind of see here. So my input here, this is u. Let's consider this to be u up here. So here's u of t. It's going to be the sine wave varying between this region. Okay. And now what I'd like to do here is, let's use red so we can match the color of the arrows here, is now I'd like to look at what is the output distance here or the output uh, response of the system. So again, maybe let's draw a little line up here. So over here, and then maybe let's come down. I think it's also going to be very similar here. Okay, so here. Okay, so in here, this is y of t. Okay, so now I'm drew these two lines here because I want to show you that, you know, if we go very slow here, so if I have a sine wave which is very slow, like this, right? Notice here that the bag or the mass, the output basically follows the input sine wave. Right? There's no amplification in magnitude, right? You get two inches of deflection here. You, get, you have a sine wave of amplitude two inches. You have an output sine wave of two inches as well, right? And notice that they're both in phase, right? The green arrow moves up and down at the same frequency as the red arrow, right? So all a Bode plot would be doing here is a Bode plot would go ahead and try to characterize this on our graph over here. So let me do that. Let me, did I drop my pen? Yeah. So for example, you know, at low frequencies, I don't know, let's, let's pick something. I don't know how fast I was oscillating. I'm going to make something up. Let's just, let's just call this low, low frequencies. Maybe it's 0.1 radians per second. Who, who knows? You can see here that the amplification factor is like a, like one, right? This magnitude here. So you put in something of two, uh, plus or minus two inches, you get something out, which is also plus or minus two inches. So the amplification factor is one, right? So let me put a little data point here. Right, And then what is the phase lag here, or the phase shift? Well, again, you see this is basically zero, right? Zero, maybe we should label this as in degrees, right? And this is unitless, right, because it's an amplification factor. So here's the first data point. You see that when I go slowly, there's, there's, there's no phase shift and there's no real amplification. Let's now ask ourselves the question of what happens when I increase the frequency, right? That's the whole point with frequency domain analysis, right? So now, keep an eye on this. I'm going to now, let's increase the frequency a little bit. And now, you can kind of see that probably this, this bottom line, like these two lines are not accurate anymore. And this is probably going to be really hard for me to do um, here. Uh, gosh, I'm going to have a hard time, like... Get, I'm going to guesstimate, some, I don't know, something like this. <laughs> and maybe you've got a better view of this from the camera than I do here. And uh, I, I apologize, my demos never seem to go quite exactly right. But what I'm getting at here is if you notice here, I increase the frequency, my input amplitude is the same here, right? All I've changed is the frequency of the excitation, but now my output is larger, right? Amplitude is larger. And furthermore, notice that the red arrow and the green arrow, they're not in phase any longer here, right? There's some lag between the two here, although their steady state frequency are the same, right? Both of them are oscillating at the same frequency. The red arrow just has more amplitude and some phase shift. So for example, if I wanted to come back and plot this, let's go, uh, you know, I don't know, like a, like a medium frequency. Right? And we see at a medium frequency, actually, the, it, there's an amplification factor greater than one, right? The thing is, is amplifying it. So maybe I better put it up here. I don't know what that number is. I mean, if you look at this, maybe this is, this is about double. So I don't know, we can guesstimate. Let's call this two, right? It's an amplification factor of two. And finally, there was some phase lag here, right? The output was lagging the input. So this theta had better be a negative number, right? So let's come down here. I don't know, I'm gonna make something up, negative uh, 20 degrees or something like that. So here's another data point. Let's keep going. Let's increase the frequency even more. All right. So now I could probably got to erase this again. And now let's go faster. Oops, see, and I said, oh no, crud. This thing's breaking. Crud, crud, crud. Hold on. Shoot. I should have made this thing a little more robust. Eh. Okay, hold on, hold on. I'll, I'll get this to work. Okay, here we go. Okay, so now, now let's go faster, right? And now look at this. Actually, it almost looks like there's a frequency here that if I also look at this, I'm getting a huge deflection now for the same input. This thing is going all over the map, right? Boy, and I, I, again, I gotta get, I, I'm gonna have to guesstimate of where this thing ends up here because I don't have a, I need an assistant. 
here, right? I need somebody who wants to be a uh, like a magician's assistant here. Crud. I don't know. Sorry, guys. This this may not be. This may not. let's try the, let's try that here, right? How's this here, right? So this sine wave. Look at this. So actually, and and look at this. They're almost like completely out of phase, right? The when the input arrow goes up, the bag is the mass is going down, and vice versa. And now you're getting this huge amplification, right? So again, coming back to our plot here. You come here to like uh, this plot over here where I can call this maybe like fast, right? Some fast input and you get this big uh, increase in amplification and you get a lot. Of, you almost get like almost, it almost looked like it was 180 degrees out of phase, but probably not exactly. Let's call this minus like I don't know, minus 120 degrees out of phase here, right? And now let's go even faster, right? Let's keep pushing this like let's keep pushing our luck here, right? And I'll erase our, my, my output lines here. Let me grab my output pen. Where did I do this thing? Well, actually, I'm not going to need it here. Watch this. This is really interesting, right? So, so here's, here's that input frequency where I get this huge deflection, right? Now, our trend is interesting, right? It seems like with increasing frequency, it just the, the amplitude seems to go up. But watch this. Let's go even faster. Let's go actually stupidly fast. This is really interesting. Look at this. The input frequency is going stupidly fast, right? I'm going, uh, I'm going very, very quickly in the input, and there's no response. The output has no response at all. Where's my red pen? Oh, here it is. Right? So if I were to draw this, right? Look at this. The, the, it's, like, it's like that, <laughs> right? The red arrow is going in between these two lines here. So fascinating here, right? What we see here is that we're over here at, how about, let's call it stupid fast, right? There's like, you're, you're getting closer to like zero here, right? You got a data point down here. I'm sure the thing is moving a little bit here. And technically what, what ended up would have happened is you, you'd be like way out here at like 180 degrees of phase here, right? So you can see here with this little physical demonstration, this is basically what a Bode plot is. The Bode plot just tells you how does the amplification and how does the phase change as a function of omega here, right? That's all a Bode plot is. So with that being said, it turns out there's a couple of other interesting nuances that will really make this what we traditionally think of as a Bode plot. So, uh, I'll tell you what, let me pause the camera. I'm going to erase the board, but I'm going to keep this picture up because we're going to make a couple of modifications to the axes here, both the X and the Y axes here, and we'll discuss those in a second. So, I'll pause the camera, erase this side, and we'll be right back in a second. Okay, so let's write down a couple of things that may be useful to make a note of regarding Bode plots here. So we saw that one, one thing to note here is all a Bode plot does here is that it uh, visualizes how the amplification, and I guess we should say amplification slash attenuation, right? Because we saw that the system can either uh, amplify the input or can also attenuate it here, but it visualizes how the amplification slash attenuation and, let me maybe underline that, and phase shift vary with omega, right? So that's what we just saw over here, okay? One other thing that people have discovered here makes analysis a little bit easier is instead of looking at the x-axis in a linear scale of omega, um, it's helpful to look at this in a semi-logarithmic kind of fashion here. So typically, let's write this down, that the x-axis, which again is frequency of the input here, omega, right, is uh, drawn in a semi-logarithmic scale. Logarithmic scale. In other words, um, what we're talking about here is basically uh, basically like a log base 10 fashion. So in, instead of these being linear, maybe maybe let's let's write this out here. So Usually you would obviously write this as something like a one, two, three, four, you know, in a linear scale. But instead, 
Each one of these is referred to as a decade here. So you will start out at something like 0.1 radians per second, and then you would go up to 1.0 radians per second, and then you'd go up to 10, and then 100 radians per second. And again, maybe let's just label that the units of this are radians per second here, right? And all you're doing is you're just compressing the x-axis to be in a log base 10 display format here, right? So um, that's something to note here. So a Bode plot, when you see it, the x-axis will almost always be in a log base 10 scale here, right? So each Euclidean distance on the graph actually corresponds to a factor of 10 uh, increase here, right? Or this is sometimes referred to as a one decade here. So maybe let's just make a note here that this is referred to as one decade. Whoops. Okay. Okay, so great. The other thing that's interesting that we may want to note here is that most Bode plots, the uh, y-axis for the amplification, the amplification factor is typically measured, not again, not in a linear scale, but measured in a decibel scale here. So let me write this down. So y-axis for amplification slash attenuation is expressed in units of decibels. Okay, and specifically here, what you'll have here is instead of magnitude of G of J omega on the y-axis here, you'll have 20 times log base 10 of that amplification factor here. So this here is a decibel, uh, gets you basically an amplification in decibels, right? So again, this term right here was sort of your quote unquote linear amplification factor, right? But when you take this 20 times log base 10 of this, you get that same amplification factor it's just measured in a different scale and the scale is referred to as decibels here one other maybe quick thing to note here um, uh, we, we talk a lot about software here in our lectures here but in MATLAB and Mathematica keep in mind here that log or log so this is the Mathematica one and this is the MATLAB here this is log base E or your natural log so be careful. This is not what you want. This thing in the fun in, in the function is actually log 10. So in MATLAB, you're going to have to do log 10, right? This is log base 10, right? And this is the one you want when you're dealing with uh, trying to compute decibels. So if you use just plain old log, you're going to get something a little bit uh, screwy here. So again, we can now revise this y-axis here. This should now be instead should be 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega and the units now become decibels or sometimes you'll see this written as db okay and maybe first let's let's go ahead and erase these numbers here and maybe it might be interesting to take a gander here at what does one uh, in a linear scale turn into in decibels here so maybe let's do a quick a little quick side note right and in, and 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 take a look at why this measurement unit is actually very helpful. So in other words, I want to consider what does G of J omega equal to one correspond to in DB, right? So again, G of J omega one means no amplification and no attenuation, right? You put in a sine wave of magnitude A, you will get out a sine wave of magnitude A, right? That's what this linear scale of one means here, right? So all I gotta do here is take 20 times log base 10 of one, okay? And if you do that, you actually end up with zero here. So what zero decibels means here is it means no amplification, right? So this first data point that we talked about earlier at low frequencies where you basically you put in a small sine wave you get out a small sine wave this now is like is zero so zero decibels is sort of your baseline anything positive here right any db which is greater than zero basically means the system is amplifying right uh, hold on amplifying 
right? And any decibel less than zero means that the system is attenuating, right? So anything above the zero line means that you're getting a bigger sine wave out than you put in. And anything below the zero dB line means the sine wave you get out is actually smaller than the sine wave you put in. So again, that's kind of interesting here. So with that, I think that's actually enough. Uh, maybe the last thing we'll, we'll typically mention is again, this Y axis on the phase is, is usually left as linear here. Um, you just get to pick the units here. Do you wanna talk about the phase being in degrees or the phase being in radians? 90% of the time you're going to see this phase expressed in degrees. So I don't know if we want to add this to our little note here of Bode plot uh, goodness, I guess. Maybe I'll try to put this over here as kind of like a side note here that the Y axis for uh, phase shift is typically uh, in units of degrees. But it could be in units of radians again. All it's talking about is an angle, right? Or, or a phase difference between two sine waves here. So you pick if that is in um, radians or in degrees here, okay? All right, so with that being said, I think we've introduced what is a Bode plot? How do you, uh, what, what goes into to making it, right? So the x-axis is in this log 10 scale here, measured in decibels, or sorry, it measured in decades. The y-axis of the amplification plot here is actually in um, this uh, kind of, let me, let me draw something <laughs> there, sorry for that here. But the y-axis is measured in decibels, which is 20 times log base 10 of the actual amplification factor. And the y-axis for your phase angle is linear, but typically expressed in units of degrees here. So that's what a Bode plot is. What I'd like to do now is let's go back to that same example we used in our previous lecture here um, of that, that, that horizontal mass spring damper here and see if we can get, uh, develop some tools in MATLAB to help us generate this type of plot automatically in software here. So tell you what, give me a second, I'll pause the camera, erase this half of the board, and we'll write up that example again. Okay, so the example we were looking at last time here was our good old friend, the mass spring damper, right, where we had this thing sitting on a horizontal platform here, and you had a spring constant, you had a damping, uh, a damper here, I think we used B here, and we this positive z of t in this direction and we're applying a force u of t on this guy right so here was our setup here and i think last time we showed that the transfer function of this system which was z of, t of s over u of s right this looks something like three over s squared plus one half s plus a four right by the time you jammed in whatever values we chose for um, mass, spring constant, and damping ratio, right? You'd get it to look like this second order system here, right? So what we were interested in doing here was again, trying to compute the Bode plot for this here, where I'm gonna put in A sine omega t, and coming out of this thing at steady state here, I wanted to understand what was A times the magnitude of G of J omega times sine of omega t plus theta here right and we saw that okay again all i need to do here is get this imaginary number g of j omega so in other words you take your transfer function g here and we showed that okay its steady state response was um to get the amplification factor you basically take everywhere you see an s and you put in j omega here right and we said that this ends up being just an imaginary number here so you get an alpha plus a beta i right so it's a real part and an imaginary part. And the real part, I think we showed last time here, and again, review that video if you really want to see this thing, right? So alpha, this was just the real part of G of J omega, right? And this looks something like 12 minus three times omega squared all over 16 minus 31 omega squared over four plus omega to the fourth. Right? Okay, and then beta here, which was the imaginary part of G of J omega. This thing was minus three omega over two, all over that same denominator of 16 minus 31 omega squared over four plus omega to the fourth, right? Okay, so we see that this imaginary number, the real part and the imaginary part, they vary as a function of omega here, right? So 
this is how we're going to generate this plot, right? All we're going to do here is we're going to plot two different things. So we can now go ahead and compute, right? All I need is um, I need to compute the y-axis for this plot here, which was 20 times log base 10 of magnitude of g of j omega here, right? Which was basically alpha squared plus beta squared to the, to the one half, right? And I guess maybe let's put this like that, right? So that was the y-axis. And the angle here, I just need to do a tan 2 of, um, in our case, beta alpha. And again, we're assuming here that a tan 2 here needs the y component and then the x component of your imaginary number here, right? Okay, so programmatically then to generate this, we can think about this. The, the, the cookbook recipe to do this is actually pretty simple here. So to generate the Bode plot, right, all you have to do here is one, first uh, list the frequencies of interest. So in other words, you go ahead and you make yourself a vector of omegas, which represent every single frequency where you, basically the x values of the plot, right? Where do you want to evaluate this thing, right? Okay, once you do that here, step two here is go ahead and compute the amplification and phase shift at each omega. Right. So basically, yeah, you get the you get the magnitude of G of J omega here and you get the angle of G of J omega right here. Right. So you use these formulas that we talked about earlier. OK, then step three here, you're going to go ahead and convert amplification to decibels. Right. Which is basically this formula up here. So I guess right up here, this is really step two and three kind of in one shebang here, and I guess this right here is really just step two here, right? Because, yeah, you're getting the angle here. You don't really have to convert units. I mean, unless you want to change it to degrees or something like that here, but all this thing is is it's just a bunch of angles here, right? And then the last thing you're going to do here is you're going to plot on a log base 10 x-axis, right? So that's your workflow here. So it's actually not that bad to generate a Bode plot. It's it's like four steps here, right? So tell you what, let's go run over to MATLAB here and actually go ahead and um, do that for this this example here. Okay, so um, I'll pause the video and I'll meet you over there in MATLAB. All right, so here we are in MATLAB. So let's go ahead and explore how to use MATLAB to generate Bode plots. Okay, so let's do our clear CLC close all. And now all we need to do here is let's go ahead and follow our four step process here for our specific example here. So if you remember, step one here was generate a list of the desired frequencies. Right. So one thing that's going to help here is um, we talked about how we like these frequencies to be spaced out, uh, not really in a linear fashion, but in a logarithmic fashion here. So what you can do here is let's go and say here and say help log space. Log space is basically like lin space here, but instead of linearly spacing these samples here, it will logarithmically space them out here. So that's super helpful. So in our case, what I can do here is let's call omega here is going to be log space going between 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the 2 here. And maybe let's use, uh, how about 300 points here? So just as a note here, this starts here at 10 to the minus 1, which is just, what, 0 0.1 radians per second here. And it ends at... 10 to the 2 here, which should be 100 rads per second here, right? So, oh, maybe let's just say starts at, there we go. Okay, so omega here, like we said, is going to start basically from 0 0.1 and go up to 100 radians per second here, okay? All right, so now that we've got that done, what do we say was step 2? Step 2 here was compute the amplification and phase shift at each frequency, Right, so we need to go ahead and get my alpha term, those that the alpha and beta, which are the real and imaginary parts. So I think the alpha one was 12 minus 3 times omega squared. Whoops, times omega squared here, right? All of this all over what was it? 16 minus 31 fourth times omega to the f squared plus omega to the fourth, right? 
I think that was our alpha term here. And the beta term was something very similar, minus 3 halves times uh, omega all over. We said the exact same denominator here, right? So let me just copy that. Okay, so now we have the alpha, which was the real part, the real part of g of j omega, right? And the beta was the imaginary part of g of j omega. So all I need to now do here is compute the uh, the magnitude of g of j omega. Let's call it a variable like this, right? And we said that's really simple. It's alpha squared plus beta squared to the one half, right? Um, and again, this is in uh, linear amplification factor, right? Amplification factor, okay? All right, so now um, what else do we need? Oh, we need, the, we need the angle, right? So I need angle of G of J omega here. That's just A tan 2 of beta and alpha, right? So here is phase in units of radians here, right? So uh, the next step here, step three here, was what? It was convert uh, amplification to decibels, right? So I want magnitude of G of J omega, but I want this measured in decibels here. So we said that is 20 times log 10, right, of magnitude of G of J omega, right? And then maybe let's also convert the angle to, the, to degrees, right? So we can say angle of G of J omega is just, uh, sorry, measured in degrees is just the angle of g of j omega, but I need to go rad to degrees, right? So I'll just convert these things into units that are helpful for plotting, right? Okay, and now step four was we are going to go ahead and plot um, on a uh, log 10 x axis. So again, one th something that might be helpful here is the semi log x function here which is very similar to plot, except it does exactly what we talked about. Uh, it puts the x-axis on a log base 10 scale instead of a linear scale here. So let's just go ahead and do that right now. So I'm going to say figure, and I'm going to make uh, a subplot here. Uh, two by one by, uh, come on, one by one here. And let's go ahead and instead of calling plot here, I'm going to call semi log x here. And I'm, I'm going to make the amplification plot, which is going to be omega and then magnitude of g of j omega measured in decibels here right so let's turn the grid on and then the y label for this plot here could be the magnitude but measured in decibels right and then let's do the other subplot 212 right for the phase so i'm going to do the same thing semi log x of w and um, the angle of g of j omega measured in degrees here Again, turn the grid on, and then the Y label for this side is going to be the um, phase, right, in units of degrees. And maybe let's go ahead and put an X label on this as well here. So the X label of this is going to be omega in units of radians per second, right? That's the frequency that we've got. Um, great. And maybe tell you what, let's put a title on this plot here. Let's call this, how about manually creating a Bode plot? Great. So you can see it's actually not too bad. It's, uh, you know, the... 30 lines of code here. So if I run this now, what we end up with is it brings up this plot that I made on the other side of the page here. Let me go ahead and just kind of blow this up so you can kind of see what's going on. And yeah, this looks pretty darn reasonable what we had earlier, right? So um, you can kind of see that, yeah, it starts flat and then you get some kind of resonance here where the amplitude starts to increase, but then it starts to roll off here and you start getting smaller and smaller amplifications here. Right, and similarly, the phase starts at zero and then drops down to 180 degrees. We're going to take a, another closer look at these in a future lecture here, in terms of what these should look like for a given system. But for now, suffice to say, this looks really reasonable. Before we leave, I want to show you one other feature that might be helpful here. Let's also go ahead and you saw here that this was all sort of manually creating the Bode plot here, right? But I think it helps give some insight into exactly what a Bode plot is and how to generate it here, right? But once you're comfortable with that, there's no reason to have to do this uh, manually for an arbitrary system. So instead, what I would recommend doing here is let's go ahead and use MATLAB's built-in function called Bode. So this is part of the control systems toolbox, I believe here. But what we can see here is let's go ahead and create a transfer function object of the system. 
So again, we have a couple of future videos. I'll leave a link to those description uh, in the description of this video if you want to remember how to build a transfer function and analyze that within MATLAB here. Um, but what we can do here is, if you remember here, what was our transfer function here? I think our transfer function was g of s is... Uh, actually, again, I'm going to do some horrible ASCII art here. Um, let me see. Where was my transfer function? Oh, yeah, here it was. It was... Uh, I think it was 3 all over... What was this thing? It was like s squared plus uh, 1 half s plus 4, right? That was our transfer function. So let's go ahead and make this thing in MATLAB here. So I'm going to make a numerator coefficient vector and a denominator coefficient vector. And then I'm going to call the tf function to create a transfer function. And now what I can do is just use the Bode command to generate the Bode plot. So you can just go ahead and say figure Bode g, and I'm going to pass it that transfer function object here. I'll run this code. And let's take a look at the two here. So again, here is what we get for manually creating the Bode plot. And here is what MATLAB's Bode function returned. And you can see these two things are virtually identical. Maybe let's put one on this side and I'll put the other one on the other side. And you can see they're basically the same thing, right? Um, okay. So with that, I think that gives us a real good introduction to what are Bode plots, how to generate them, how to use some MATLAB tooling here to um, make a Bode plot for an arbitrary system. What I'd like to do over the next three lectures here, or actually potentially more here, is start digging into Bode plots. So in the immediate next video, um, you can actually see on this plot here that there's this uh, resonant peak here. I'd, I'd like to take a slight small detour and start talking about how to calculate this resonant peak here, about where, at what frequency you get the maximum excitation from the system. And then in the following two uh, videos after that, we'll talk about how to break down a transfer function or break down an individual system and look at how the Bode plot can be built for that system out of smaller individual components. So in other words, we're going to try to get some real insight into how this Bode plot is related to the transfer function of the system here. And that is going to lead to opening a lot more doors down the road, especially when we want to start designing active control systems here, which use Bode plots and use the frequency response of the system to, uh, to, to guide the design of the control system. So... With that being said, I really hope you enjoyed the video today here on an introduction on Bode plots. If so, please uh, like the video and uh, subscribe to the channel. It really helps me continue to make these videos here. And I will hope to catch you at one of these future videos where we will continue our discussion on frequency domain analysis and really start to dive deep into the analysis and trying to gain some intuition into how a system and its frequency response will help guide us in control system design in the future. So I hope to catch you at one of those future videos. I'll talk to you later. Bye.